you get to the medical school, so you perform, you write your papers, you get you want to get your residency slot, you did well on your boards. There's no empathy course. And if they have one, it's not really graded, and there's no incentive. From Offscript Media, I am Matthew Zachary, and this is Out of Patience. Some of you may have heard about this acclaimed Netflix series called Lennox Hill, because if you haven't, you've got to check it out. Four doctors at New York's storied Lennox Hill Hospital balance their personal lives and their dedication to their patients in this incredible documentary series. And one of those doctors joins me right here in studio today. Dr. David Langer is the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at Lenox Hill and the co-founder of Playback Health, and I'm fanboying for all the reasons. Touching people's brains to save their lives is indeed an interesting badge of honor to wear and a burden to bear. And as someone who has personally had their brain touched by a neurosurgeon, I have the most profound respect imaginable for the practice. David is also one of the most genuine and empathic human beings around who happens to be one of the most recognized leaders in his craft. Among many other things, we talk about the deep-rooted missing element of humanity and empathy in medicine and the ebb tide that that lack of empathy has yielded in pervading the practice of medicine itself. If you're not already swooning over David himself, I will also mention that David was a first responder to the COVID pandemic when the shit hit the fan right here in New York City. This man was at the Javits Center treating people every day. With that and more, please enjoy part one of my bromance with Dr. David Langer. Dr. David Langer, I'm actually staring at you. You're in the room. It's COVID. We're taking our precautions. You're kind of a doctor, so I think you know what you're doing. And you're also the second neurosurgeon I've ever spoken to, the first of whom saved my life. So what are you going to do for me? Well, first off, I'm six feet with you with a mask off, so (laughs) I hope I don't infect you. That would be bad for your track record (laughs) because you've been pretty good so far. Trying. I'm just thrilled. I'm really thrilled. We were introduced through a mutual friend. And like I said, I've only known one neurosurgeon who saved my life and I've been living in the brain space for 25 years, and it's an awkward, weird little niche market to be a part of. And then I got introduced to you. We had dinner. We mishpacht. We bromanced very quickly. And it's just fascinating to see, A, how far neurosurgeries come. But just this, just to have a man of your expertise in front of me who's touched other people's brains, being someone who's had his brain touched in all the right ways. I had gloves on. <laughs> So you were nine and you said, I want to be a neurosurgeon and touch brains and be a Netflix star. Exactly. Go, start your story. <laughs> exactly. What drove How you to medicine? You know? Yeah, well, we know each other. What, what, what drove you to medicine? It was sort of an inevitability. I see with my daughter now, my grandfather and my father were both physicians. And I, uh, from a very early age, uh, my mother has pictures of me with a uh, stethoscope around my neck as a two or three year old. So, you know, these things start young, probably. I think, you know, often people can veer off as they get to into more of the nitty gritty of what that takes. You know, we're born maybe with uh, an aspiration in ourselves, but ultimately it requires that you'd sample other things perhaps, or ensure that you can actually be successful. And I never really had problems with the kind of uh, gold star stuff you have to go through as a pre-medical student, medical student, or as a resident. It, it came naturally to me and probably because it's um, genetically programmed to do this somehow. Yeah, your telomeres were baked in from your family genetics, right? Well, I think that what's probably baked in is empathy and um, hard work and uh, a certain level of intelligence. Not, I don't think I'm a genius, uh, but there's a certain necessity to have a, just a basic IQ that can get through some of the rudimentary stuff. I think it has less to do with how successful you are as a physician, but you know, it's a combination of your emotional structure, the mentors and the people that you look up to and how you filter that. And then can you just handle some of the mechanical aspects of uh, what it takes to become a physician? You have all the right words. <laughs> well done. Was neurosurgery in your sights in the beginning? And like, how did no. you decide subspecialty wise to go into that direction? No, I, I, I remember I was probably not even in medical school yet. Um, so I know it must have been there somewhere. 
when I, when I went to ca- a summer camp and my uh, counselor came to visit us when he was interviewing for plastic surgery fellowships. He's about six, seven years old than me. And so I must have been in college and thinking about what I was going to do when I go to medical school. And I mentioned neurosurgery to him. He said, why would you do that? Everybody dies. It's horrible. You're too nice. It's, you can't do that. So You're too nice. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I don't think it really – my dad had a stroke. and I took a year off. went to Cambridge in England between college and medical school. And um, I came home for winter break. And the night I came home, my father had a stroke. And, uh, you know, that was a searing experience. I was home for a month. I was supposed to go back after two weeks and staying home for, a, I think, a month and a half. I was actually – flew back to England the day the Challenger blew up in 1986 – so I can, I remember that event. So I, I remember the exact day when I came home and the exact day when I went back to England, which is just so bizarre that these two, one obviously an international tragedy and the first more of a local personal tragedy. At the time, I hadn't started medical school. When I got to medical school, I wanted to be like my dad. I thought I wanted to be a cardiologist. And I did have a an innate kind of attraction to neuroanatomy. Neuroanatomy is separate from from just gross anatomy. You study the brain separately. And as opposed to gross anatomy where you do everything below the head or the face and the head. And I really like neuroanatomy, not thinking I want to be a neurosurgeon. Um, but then I, you know, my father's illness, he, he never really recovered. He lived but didn't recover. He had a dense weakness on the left side. And uh, I got very comfortable with neurological illness. You know, in people who are weak, who have a deficit, you know, sometimes, it's, you know, people shy away from them. They don't want to hold the weak arm. You know, there's almost a an innate sense of you know that's that's un- makes me uncomfortable. And I, I graduate, I very rapidly became comfortable with neurological disease. I went into my rotations, and I really didn't like internal medicine. I, I found it to be selfish and relatively boring. The the kind of mechanics of it, the rounding and the constant banter. The, the, the residents didn't seem very happy. They weren't collaborative. And I'm by nature a collaborative person. Wait, and, um, is that traditional or was that just your experience? I think it's traditional. I mean, I, I think that medicine itself is a very cerebral field, especially when I went to UPenn, so it was a very Ivy League place. A lot of, you know, professorial people who want to prove to you how smart they are by figuring out the diagnosis. You know, the make a diagnosis in a tough case is meditative, almost like, um, you know, Talmudic sometimes. And so the input you get, and you want to prove that you're, can, you know, be that guy. My father was like that. He was thought of as the best clinical cardiologist at UPenn, but he was also, I think he was very, he was a brilliant guy. Uh, he probably was a genius. You know, was a, he was known for that. It's hard to share that with other people. You know, you're either right or you're wrong. And if you contribute, you get, you get positive feedback for that. I just didn't like it. I, I found that people were trying to prove that they were smarter than you, or they wrote something in their note that you didn't put in there. And I just didn't enjoy it very much. I also couldn't imagine not having the operating room. When I went to the OR, I just loved it. I loved the pace of it. I couldn't imagine rounding and seeing patients every day, and that's it, like no procedures. And I was, you know, relatively athletic. I was a crew, a road crew at Penn and in England, and I liked hard work. I liked the collaboration, the teamwork. And the, the surgery residents loved it. They, they were all, when a new patient came in, they were excited for the case, for a patient because they got a new case. Well, the medical residents were like, oh my God, how many hits did you get last night? That was the discussion in the mornings. The surgery residents wanted to take care of patients and the medical residents were, you know, didn't want to take care of patients. And so I realized if I was going to do cardiology that um, I'd have to do internal medicine residency and I, I, I couldn't fathom doing that. So then I was thinking about doing cardiac surgery. And in some ways that may have been the best thing for me. At the time, though, uh, cardiac stents were just coming out. This is uh, around uh, late 80s. So I thought, you know, I was in the hospital late all the time, and the cardiac surgeons were always there with sick patients, and they were all divorced, and um, they had troubled family lives and um, had girlfriends and wives and this kind of thing. Uh, very very male-dominated also, I might add. And it still is. But um, I said I just didn't think I could do that. And uh, I thought there was probably the wrong time to be going into cardiac, that the heyday of cardiac surgery was over. Well, fast forward, I ended up going to neurosurgery. I got divorced, and I went to neurovascular surgery, and stents and catheter-based devices blew up my specialty anyway. Right. So it's one of these things you never know. Uh, you know, there's a certain aspect of luck and, uh, and just happenstance that lead to these decisions. But I did it because of my relationship with my father and what my father went through and the experience I had in neuroanatomy. And, and I think... There's a tendency in neurosurgery, it's, it's a proving ground. You know, it's, it, it's a myth field. It has a certain austere 
um, disconnected, like the brain surgeon, you know, kind of like buckaroo bonsai kind of thing. We're dating ourselves, you know that. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> well, it even comes for the like, Doctor Strange. Oh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch. Gesundheit. Exactly. You know, that was he was a nurse. They always use neurosurgeons at this kind of like, you know, elite, elite, yeah, esoteric, separate of medicine kind of. I people. think a lot of guys do it for that reason, especially men. And I, it wasn't really that might have been in me somewhere back when I was in high school or college, but. It morphed into something more sub substantive because of my father's illness. And um, I chose the right field for myself. You know, going back, I've, ha I've been in many dogmatic, principled, philosophical, like deep philosophical chats about the value of the way med school has evolved over 180 years. You know, you went in the 80s. Is it any different today? I mean, I guess my the framing of the question is the familiarity of like your first word on this talk was empathy. And there's... Empathy training. Do you be? Are you born empath empathic? Can you learn empathy? And you're going into medicine to do X, Y, and Z. What are your thoughts on the advancements of that dogmatic principle into medical school? Well, if you look at medical school education, it, it really didn't change until what's called the Flexner Report, which is a kind of historic change in the way medical medical schools were administrated. You know, up until that time, I think it was the early 1900s. Medical schools, you paid to go, and they all had different curriculums and if they approved you, you know, you went out there and practiced medicine. And so there was, think about it, there was the licensing process and it was just crazy, you know, and there were all these kind of crazy things people were doing. There wasn't a lot of cross fertilization. So the standardization of medical school education really happened after the Flexner report. Um, but, you know, I think since World War II, there's been a structured medical school curriculum that's two years of clinical uh, basic science and then two years of clinical medicine. That began to change during my time. Harvard Medical School, for one, started a brand new curriculum, which it's changed a million times since. And Penn also had, you know, an aggressive earlier entry into the into the clinics, you know, which it's also a marketing campaign. We're going to go in the clinics day one. Well, like, then you have like, you know, anxiety because you're a fake. You know, it's like you can't have it both ways. I remember my first day in the clinics, I was wearing a stethoscope and a white coat and the patients think I'm a doctor. And I'm like, I'm not a, you know, they're asking me questions. I felt, you know, it's like the impos an imposter syndrome. And, you know, people have to be patient and you have to spend the time and you have to put the work in. Our youth is incredibly impatient and they, everything has to happen now. And I was too. To offer up earlier access to the clinics, that doesn't mean you're a doctor. But it's not necessarily better. It's just more sexy and more interesting. So given that experience, I think schools have evolved. Like Hofstra Medical School, for example, uh, trains all their medical students as EMTs. They're in the first month or so. So they're in an ambulance. You know, they see the patients having their heart attack, having their stroke, seeing the patients transferred. I think it's a really brilliant. That is. That's incredible. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So they, that, that's what I think because you don't need to be you no know, pathophysiology to see the person suffering. And um, I think that uh, this is, I think having more women in medicine Frankly, or women in everything. It's a better thing. <laughs> it's a better thing. I think that's what's really had the biggest impact. I don't think you can learn, that, learn empathy. I really don't. I think uh, this is something that comes from your upbringing, the way you see your parents or your, you know, your close relationships or people who affect you growing up. You see how they treat people, what they talk about at the dinner table, how they treat people at a bar or restaurant. You know, do they yell and scream at the waitress because the food is cold? You know, I remember one time I was at a restaurant at uh, in Miami at Joe's Stone Crab, and uh, we were waiting for like two hours for our table, and uh, we finally sit down, and we were all pissed off, and it's an expensive restaurant. The waitress comes over, and we hadn't ordered menus yet. It was totally packed, and we're sitting there, and we finally get the menus. I'm like, listen, you know, it'd be really nice if you could just get the menus. She goes, she starts to cry. I'm like, are you okay? She goes... I just got diagnosed with breast cancer this morning. I'm like, oh my God. You know, the truth is everybody's living in their own world and, and we all have our filters. And I think the trouble with doctors in general, if you're going back to that story, is every single person we come in touch with is much worse off than we are. Unfortunately, because of uh, fee-for-service, ego, you know, the clinical trials, academia, these things all are negative impactors on that empathy. They have to be because... If you bring those things to the point of care with you, they detract from this other stuff. And we're not taught that. I mean, you don't get through medical school thinking about this. You get into medical school, so you perform, you write your papers, you get your, want to get your residency slot, you did well on your boards. There's no empathy course. And if they have one, it's not really graded and there's no incentive, you know? So 
to me, if anything, what gave me more empathy was my father's illness, maybe my innate personality. But if anything, as I've gotten older um, and I've seen the results of, I mean, I'm, I'm a humble guy. More, I'm more actually more humble now than I've ever been. And um, it's partly because I've realized that no matter how hard I've trained and how empathetic I've been, bad things happen sometimes. And um, you have to get used to that. And if you, and the trouble is the more empathetic you get, um, it's harder to come to work and take care of really difficult problems. So if anything, as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm more afraid. And um, it doesn't mean I'm not a good doctor or not able to do what I'm doing, but it probably makes me a better decision maker. I really consider maybe the lesser of two evils sometimes. But empathy is not a easy to teach. And um, I think I find it kind of fascinating that um, you know medical schools or, or healthcare systems suddenly wake up and think that's suddenly important. I mean... Part of our we have an idea. Yeah. Let's teach empathy. Yeah, I mean, if you, and I say, look, if people aren't empathetic, they should never have gone to medical school in the first place. But yeah, but if you're not empathetic, do you know you're not? How can you be aware of not having empathy if you have no? It's well, like it's like uh, emotional intelligence is a baseline of self awareness and how you interact with other people and and your impact on society as a, as a just a creature, you know, in civilization. I, I wanted to go back to a quick story because. When I was running Stupid Cancer, we had so many conversations about, you know, peer-to-peer and caregiving and taking care of yourself. But there was always this cultural persona of, quote-unquote, the doctor, the doctor. And I feel like there's a, a reasonable rationale why traditional perception of the doctor is what it is. People want to avoid the doctor. You know, we're okay going to the dentist or whatever, whatever, but it's the doctor. I don't want to know what's wrong with me. But you're in a situation where, uh uh-oh, something's really wrong with me and I'm putting my trust in you. I I look at what happened to me. This is the 90s, granted, when there really was no survivorship or caring for the patient. It was very binary and biological. You know, I was a concert pianist. And my left hand didn't work. And they wanted to give me chemo. That would have ruined my left hand forever. And they didn't take into consideration what mattered to me. And and the only real human, and this is not to cast shade on anybody because they saved my life, all these people. But the only genuine human that I felt expressed empathy was my neurosurgeon. And That's shocking. I I, I mean... (laughs) Well, he's a pediatric neurosurgeon too, so... He was amazing, yeah. but and he took off on he was practicing Jew. He took off on Shabbat to meet with my parents. Like like this was where he felt You're lucky. I, I we got people are like your patients are lucky to have you. We lucked out in that sense. Well, I feel you can give me one example how being empathetic helps your career. I, I challenge you. Or how does it help you make more money or get ahead or how become a leader? It doesn't happen. And no, so there's the, no money in it. No, there's no money. There's no victory there's no in it. Benefit. There's, yeah. There's. there's if anything, there's a D benefit because you actually have to go home at night and deal with it. And I think that in the end, it's, I don't think it's going to change very much because the factors are shiny objects, the things we're chasing, whether it's fame or fortune as medical professionals. Uh, you know, we're ambitious people and we have to deal with a system that's designed to weed out uh, the smartest people first, then train them in a way that they, you know, learn a skill. Remember, Empathy only comes into play when there's a failure. You know, if, if things are going well... There's no need for there's it. There's no need for it. You can just go home and congratulate yourself and, and they can send your patient can send you bottles of wine and you feel great about yourself. Um, and so, in general, most people do well. And in fact, the people that don't do well is when you're really needed. There's, you know, many surgeons, in fact, especially in, in high-risk business like cardiac surgery or neurosurgery, just and I from the Netflix show, I, I got a lot of feedback from guys who just say, I can't do that. You know, I, I would never open myself up to patients. It's like a protective mechanism. It's like I don't I don't want to go home and worry about the patients. I want to have a happy life. I don't want to go home and like bring it home to my kids or have it affect my relationship. Now that then I think that's just an excuse. It's easier just to ignore it. And especially in high volume fields where you maybe see the patient before the surgery and then maybe once afterwards, you just completely become a robot. And I could never do that. I didn't go into medicine to be that. And if you do, a lot of people do. I mean, because medicine's super cool. Like you can live your whole life doing cases and doing really cool cases and writing about them and telling about how great you are and F the patients because it doesn't really matter. And so if you're not built that way and if you don't really allow it to grow inside you, it either never was there to begin with or it disappears because 
the stress of the job and the reality of the, of the world that you deal with, your shiny objects, how you're getting paid, how you're being promoted, why you're being recruited has nothing to do ever with how empathetic you are. Maybe with the exception to your partners. And that I also think is very important. And that's a whole other discussion. But that medicine is very dog eat dog. There's a lot of co internal competition as much within a department sometimes as external. And so all in all, it's a very, very challenging business to really be a sensitive, empathetic person, despite what we should be. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. David, you mentioned that obviously empathy potentially cannot be trained. It is innate in all of us by predisposition, perhaps. You happen to be one of those doctors that have empathy. And you mentioned before uh, in the other half of the show that the unbearable lightness of being, you know, of having empathy means you have to carry that emotion home with you to your friends, to your family, to your internal life at three in the morning. What are you thinking about? What have you found, what have your practice has been to manage that and that you could teach to other doctors to make sense of the madness at three in the morning for themselves? I think, you know, I was just on a, we did an interview today with a guy named Zach Escal, who's a former Marine. I met him at Javits Center when I was there. He brought this up. I, mean, I know this is the case, but you can't be so hard on yourself. And uh, if you're really true to your ethic and true to yourself and are always trying the best you can, that's all you can do. But, you know, there's bad luck. You know, things happen. I think uh, you learn that by failing. You know, if you were successful all the time, you would need empathy. So when you do fail, when there are complications, you have to make a choice of whether you're going to allow the empathy piece of you to grow and mature and actually feed back on you in a positive way by making you realize these things, or you reject it and you become an egomaniac and a narcissist. And I think that's why there's so many narcissistic people who are surgeons, because they just don't develop that side. That, that's, that side of them is never developed. They often can't handle, they don't even look at complications as complications. It's always some excuse. It just allows you from making yourself better, that when you fail, you have to look at yourself first. But I know that every day I come to work, I really I'll always try to do the best I possibly can. And uh, I've made mistakes, I've hurt people, um, and I've done wrong. But it was always, it was never because I was doing the case that shouldn't be done, or I've been operating on somebody because I wanted to make a lot of money, or I wasn't up to the task of that operation. And um, that's, a, that's a huge, you know, challenge. And I think that over a period of time, remember, I'm a very different person and surgeon than I was when I first started. In fact, I'm a different person than I was before COVID and before Netflix. But the development of this piece of you is, is critical, in my opinion, to elevating to a different level. And I'm really grateful. I, I've, I'm there. I feel almost like what's a, when you're enlightened, you know, and you just suddenly it, it all makes sense. I, this whole experience with COVID. And Post gestalt. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it that way. And, but th th that's why this, this whole mantra that you have to go through once when there's a, a problem is so important. And the trouble is, is now, you know, I've had, I had a terrible complication this past month, which really accelerated this in me because it happened the same time as the attention from Netflix and the, and the kind of the, the COVID experience and how that seared me. And there was a perfect time to happen. 
it wasn't, I'm, I'm, I'm upset it happened, but it really for, forced an acceleration of this kind of like self-awareness and acceptance and um, grief that um, I think is, is going to make me a much better surgeon, leader, and human being. You had mentioned just then and several times on the show so far about uh, the Javits Center. And as of this taping here in August of 2020, we're amidst the COVID pandemic. Thankfully, here in New York, it's gotten a whole lot better. But at the onset in March and April, you were taken way out of your job description and offered up your services like as a total, complete, full-on first responder when they set up the army beds at the Javits Center. That must have been, I mean, I can't even imagine that, and that's a platitude to say to you staring at your face right now, but what was that like to be, I won't say yanked out, you know, this was not a neurosurgery play, you were brought in to be a doctor. Well, I'll start to just talk about perception. Yeah. And um, the Javits was a public, visible effort by the government, there were like 15 organizations there, the, you know, the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the FEMA, the U.S. government, state government, you know, Department of Health, you name it. There were just so many different organizations there. Northwell. So it had a very, it was the public display of COVID care for the whole nation and for New York City. I had already been at Lenox Hill doing this stuff for six weeks. We kind of decided early on that uh, sitting home waiting to get infected or being quarantined to wait to, when the neurosurgery patients came back was a huge mistake. By the first week when we went when shut down, I was home. And we were on these teams meetings and talking to the hospital and heard the volume was going up and there was a potential for a quote unquote redeployment to something else. And I realized, you know, the best thing for us to do was to take control of that narrative. If we sat at home and waited to get redeployed, we might've been in some field hospital doing intake or checking temperatures. And nurse surgeons are, are we are, have experience with sick patients. We are, we're, we're comfortable with illness and death. Uh, we understand how to talk to people about difficult things. And so I said, look, you know, what we should probably do, if we're going to be needed, we might as well need it as intensive care doctors. We got to learn about COVID first. And I didn't have matters of ventilator and since I was a resident and I hadn't known pulmonary physiology. So I quickly read about a lot of this stuff, watched a bunch of YouTube videos on managing a ventilator. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but then I went in, we weren't really the primary treater, but what we did was we used playback, our communication tool. We would round with the teams in the morning. Learned, you know, rounded, so we went through all the medical stuff and listened to decision-making, contributed at time, looked at x-rays, looked at the pulmonary, the ventilator settings, saw how patients reacted, looked at their labs. And then when we were done rounding, we would go and either make videos or call patients' families at home to let them know how they were doing. And the beauty of it is that it connected a lot of different dots. It connected my interest in using technology for empathy and for communication. Number two, when you were talking to family members, they want to know, what's his, his white count today? how much oxygen is he on? So you're literally looking at the medical record in front of the families and you were forced to see the patterns of COVID. And, you know, we learned, I learned a lot about the disease. It was like, oh yeah, at least saw the oxygen rising or dropping or the white count going up and you'd pick things up and I would go back to the ICU guy. Hey, did you see this this morning? You know, there's, a, there's something in the lab you ought to check out. We're, you know, we're, we're not idiots. And so we contributed to the care at the same time we were talking to families and using technology. It was freaking great. So we did that for like, I did that for five weeks but then the peak started to come. We weren't seeing the, and we realized I wasn't going to be needed to be, to be an intensive care doctor, that we probably had enough of you know, the intensivist and the men, the pulmonary guys, all the guys that really trained to do that. And then uh, Javits opened up. And when Northwell got involved, there was a goat rodeo over there. I mean, they had essentially army docs that were trained at the theater of war, how to do trauma, who are now taking care of sick medical patients in a, in a convention center, essentially a glorified tent. And so... And they also had the same exact communication problem, too, that we were having, but to an order of magnitude more because patients were dropped off there, didn't have identification set up, and they were setting up this whole thing from scratch. One of the women who was running it for Northwell said, Dave, maybe you should come over and try using playback over Javits. Well, when I got there, it was such a mess. It was like the last thing they really needed was some Yahoo neurosurgeon with a mobile application to do anything. <laughs> so what she said, I told Rita that I don't think I'm going to be able to make this work here. So why don't you go down to the ICU downstairs and talk to some of the army docs? Maybe, you know, you've had some experience with COVID because Lennox was the tip of the spear with learning about COVID. We had got on Zoom calls with doctors from Wuhan and learned a lot about the disease really early. And they were just starting. So they were where we were like six weeks ago. So I realized I knew more about, I didn't know as much about that they did about intensive care medicine, but I knew a hell of a lot more about COVID than they did. I said, look, I'll come in. 
I'll do a shift. I'll do the morning shift. So I would get in around five o'clock and I'd work there till 2.30. And so I did a seven hour shift and because they had two additional shifts or about eight hour shift. And um, I got back to Lenox by three o'clock so I could, you know, be back and do the departmental stuff in the afternoon. And it was just amazing. And um, it, I tell people this day, the but saving... You, but you didn't have to. You chose no. to. That's what's really yeah. evocative here. Well, you know what? There's a David Brooks op-ed piece. I talk about this in talks I give called The Age of Coddling is Over. It's from April 15th or 14th of this year. And I love David Brooks. And uh, his, his thesis was that, you know, we're too kind to our kids and we, they get great inflation and helicopter parents. And it was kind of the same old hackneyed op-ed piece. And when I got to the middle of it, he started talking about medical training. And that medical training, unlike, you know, the humanities or, or even some other, you know, government, is that it's you're right or you're wrong. It's a plus or it's a minus. If science tests either get the answer right or you get it wrong. There's no, like, subjective nature to it. It's like being a golfer being, versus being a gymnast. You had this many shots, you can get a little lucky, but this is how many shots you've made. Mm-hmm. Gymnast, you got some, you know, Russian judge doesn't like you, you don't, you get a 9.1, the Russian lady gets a 10, you're screwed. Right. So in the end, I think that, you know, reading this, the, he moved on to talk about the importance of grit and, and tenacity and courage, and that, that basically you, you train for this, that there's an element of this is what you're made to do. And to sit on my butt waiting to be told where to go just didn't sit well with me. And it didn't sit well with any of our guys. And in the end, this move to Javits was more, it actually was accidental because I wasn't planning on going there to do intensive care medicine. I really wanted to use playback. But in, in the end, and in fact, you know, it never got that busy in the ICU, thankfully. But my maybe, maybe today, one of my greatest successes. And I mean, I've been done crazy operations that have required a huge amount of effort. The one woman... It was my first patient that came in who needed to be intubated, but I knew that the best thing to do for her was to get her dried out with diuretics and give her high dose steroids. We got her extubated two days later and she went home. And it was only because of the experience that I had in Lennox to know the things to do. If I had been there, she may have survived, but I felt so gratified. It was like this other part of me. It was just, it wasn't about, you know, neurosurgery. This was just caring for people and impacting a single life. And it brought me back to the core mission that I've always had. And that was, in some ways, the greatest and most valuable case of my career, in all honesty. And I'll never forget it. We always forget the people we screw up. You don't remember the positive ones most of the time. You know, I forgot. <laughs> but because the nature of it and the emotion behind it and the effort it made to get there, you know, you know, Margaret Mead, who's an anthropologist, and I tell the story a lot, was asked by a student, what what was the first sign of civilization in her mind with all of her, you know, archaeological digs? What was her, the first sign of civilization? And she's, you know, you, the student thought that she took about clay pots or hooks or art on the walls or fire, you know, something like that, you know, burned wood, you know, whatever. She says, no, the first sign of civilization was finding a healed femoral fracture in a human. Because that suggests to heal a femoral fracture, if you break your leg, you're in a, you're trailing, you can't keep up with your tribe, you get eaten or attacked, you know, they attack the weakest. So the fact that you have a healed fracture means that someone bound up the wound, carried you, fed you, you know, protected you. Nurtured you back to health. Right, until, to protect you until you could walk again. And that's the first sign of civilization because we're at our best when we serve others. And in the end, the bottom line is that what this moment for me was. It was like, that was the femoral fracture. That was it. And these, these experiences seared into me. It became my new me. And when I had the, you had the Netflix experience on top of that, where I, I began to see myself through other people's eyes. Like I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing it. But the reaction people have had to me and the feedback I've gotten, whether it's letters or emails, you realize that I've been able to develop a voice for this and I've become much more comfortable with myself. I'm not trying to prove anything. And I can live in a very peaceful comfortable place really for the first time in my life because I know I'm doing the right thing and I'm not going to apologize for it. Well, there you have it, my friends. Part one of two of my incredibly profound conversation with Dr. David Langer. You know, if you can't already tell, he is one of the most passionate, articulate, and empathetic doctors I've ever known and rightfully so. I am profoundly inspired by David's approach to humanism in medicine and appreciation for what needs to change about med school and the lack of empathy therein coupled with his genuine recognition of self-care because you can't save the world till you save yourself. 
Well, we've only just scratched the surface. Part two of our conversation dives even deeper into the man himself, his entrepreneurial pensions to reboot the doctor-patient relationship, and how he's handled his newfound international notoriety as the star of the Netflix series, Lennox Hill. Stay tuned, true believers, and we'll see you back here real soon. MZ out. That's all for today, folks. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Jen Horanjeff and Andrew McDowell. Darren Tun is our production intern. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Matthew Zachary. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make guest recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. <laughs>